Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Many of you out there know what day this is. So we're looking uh, at a two-day period in which uh, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. We're going to continue on in our study in Corinthians. But before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful, Heavenly Father, for this time that you've given us, for the exciting days that we have ahead, that we can keep our eyes focused on you. We are so aware of our limitations. We just ask that as we study your word together and feast upon your word together, you just open our eyes to understand the wondrous, marvelous truth of your grace and how that that applies to our lives. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you, not of the Holy Spirit, but just foolishness. But seal to our hearts that which is truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We are going through 2 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had paused at the end of verse 15 the, of the 11th chapter. The 11th chapter has been dealing with the authority and the authenticity of God's message. Uh, in this particular case, God's messenger, I've asked you to look at the Apostle Paul, not as some hero of the faith, nor as some champion that you know, that we ought to emulate, but rather is one God chose to complete the Word of God. We know from our studies in Colossians that the Holy Spirit chose Paul to complete the Word of God. And so Paul's life in, in ministry was a fill-in while the Bible was coming to completion. We are told in Timothy that his redemption, that is his coming to know what God has done for him in Christ was a prototype so that we could see how all others would come to know Jesus Christ and God chose him to complete his word and we know that what we understand of biblical doctrine we get from the epistles of Paul. Now that does not mean that we virtually deify Paul or consider Paul as something separate from Christ or God's Word or the prophets. And to make that section of the Bible as, as some sanctified portion of Scripture that stands above all of the rest of the Word of God. So with that in mind, Well, we looked at we looked at the exhortations to a group of carnal believers. We saw practical illustrations of the outworking of God's grace and our opportunity to share in that. Where we then entered a section concerning the authenticity, the reliability of the message uh, of the messenger. And by the time that we got to the 15th verse of the 11th chapter, we had an amazing statement made by the Holy Spirit that Satan's activity as far as the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned is centered in the ministry, is centered in Christian service as we call it today. I'm sure that Satan has one particular way of working when it comes to those who are non-elect, but it seems apparent that he has another when it comes to those who are elect. And that his main method of operation when it comes to the children of God, to God's family, is to array his messengers as messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He not only arrays himself that way, but he, he arrays his messengers that way. Verse 15, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed, and that is a Greek word which speaks 
of the outward appearance as an actor would put on a costume, put on an outward form or an outward appearance to portray a character. So Satan and his ministers put on an outward appearance or disguise, if you will, to array themselves as ministers of righteousness. However, their end is according to their works. And I spent some time pointing out to you that that's a totally different end than ours. Our reward is based not upon our works, but upon our effort. Their end is according to their works. And how we praise God that our end is according to the work of Christ, whereas their end is according to their works. And folks, and I don't believe that there is any simpler way to distill the great difference between those who are God's people and those who are not in that simple statement. We see that our end is not according to our works. We bought, we wanted, and we deserved hell. But God took that and he placed it on Christ so that our end is in fact based upon the work of Jesus Christ, whereas the non-elect's end is based upon his works. That is what our text is showing us. This also is true, as we see in this verse, of Satan's ministers. Now then, I'm not here to tell you folks, okay, who's a minister of Satan and, and who is not. I don't believe that I can find a passage of Scripture, a single passage that tells me that as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I ought to uh, be telling you people uh, who is teaching the Word of God truthfully and who is not, who you ought to listen to, uh, who you should not. I try my best not to mention any names on this channel. I don't think I should. I don't think I have to. When you come to the passage of Scripture that we're studying, we have suddenly been told that the way that Satan works, at least in the area of the body of Christ, is to array his messengers as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 13, they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. Why don't I have the right to translate that as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what they claim to be. Now, the only way that I can explain the rest of chapter 11, folks, and most of chapter 12, is to say to you that here by the Holy Spirit is a beautiful illustration of what a minister or the apostle of Christ looks like. And I believe strongly that as a messenger of Christ, my responsibility is to present the, this passage to you so that you can look at another minister and determine whether they bear the marks of a real apostle of Christ or a minister of Christ. Or, or they do not. It seems to me that the Holy Spirit ought to be able to take the uh, word here and deal in your life as he does in mine. I strongly feel that the prime responsibility of this ministry, this fellowship, is to present the word faithfully to you, trusting that the Holy Spirit leads you in that word with that bit of introduction now, I want to suggest that verses 16 through 33 apparently are there so that I can contrast a true apostle with a minister of Satan. For I was told in the 15th verse at the end of that paragraph that I should not be amazed that Satan's ministers are made up to look like ministers of righteousness. Therefore, I conclude that Verses 16 through 33 are not some attempt of Paul to be overly humble and the Holy Spirit forcing him uh, not to be humble and, and, and giving his personal testimony. Like this only applies to Paul, you know. Some think that verses 16 through 33 are Paul's own personal testimony. I do not. I think it's an illustration 
as the you know they think it's how it illustration as to how we ought to give our testimony i think that's a wrong a wrong assumption i believe that the passage of scripture is not paul's personal testimony but the holy spirit's indication of what a minister of righteousness looks like first of all okay i would suggest to you that the passage verses 16 through 33 I suggest that a true apostle of Christ doesn't boast, all right? That apparently there was in Corinth an interest in pushing some particular individual or a group of individuals or, 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 or work. Uh, you know, big surprise, right? Now, you'd never, of course, you'd never see that among us, right? All right? It is astounding how easy, how prevalent boasting is among Christians. We seem to need something about which we can boast. In this particular ministry, it is our tremendous adherence to the Word of God. We're like no other, you know, you know church on the, on the world wide web. You know, in fact, anybody that doesn't uh, subscribe to this channel right here, you know, is probably not learning the truth. And, and folks, you know, that's a foolish boast. That is that is somehow an insidious in, insinuation that, you know, poor old Holy Spirit, you know, he's, he's unable to work anyplace else in the world except BHF, you know. It may be hard for you to, to find a group of believers with whom to fellowship with. If you leave BHF, I, I get that. I really do. The predominant growth is always, though, going to be Satan's ministers of righteousness, not God's ministers of righteousness, because people love to follow the flesh. You know, a 10-year-old can get more views than we get here, you know, falling off a log. I don't have much that I can boast about in the numbers department, so I can boast about my adherence to the study of this book. You know, my being a champion of truth my deep spirituality, you know, and all of, all of those are boasts, and they're wrong, okay? This is not the only body of believers, folks. The Holy Spirit is shepherding. I'm fairly positive this is not the only group of, of sheep or lambs in which he has interest. Pretty sure of that. What I'm trying to suggest that it, that that in any way in which we boast, we've taken glory from Christ. We put it on ourselves. I think that's a mark of carnality. I think that's a mark of Satan's operation. Dearly beloved, there are many who want to boast in the flesh or after the flesh. And that's what Paul is saying. So I'm going to do that also. Now, now doesn't that doesn't that sort of make the entire thesis void? You know, if that's a mark of Satan's ministers of, of righteousness, then what right does the Holy Spirit have here to allow Paul to boast? Ah, but we got to look at the boast. I'm going to boast because apparently you're willing to bear with fools, seeing ye, are, ye yourselves are wise. Verse 19. It's a, it's a beautiful Greek verse for those of you who read Greek. I don't really know how to translate that into English. Uh, for you endure fools gladly seeing that you are not fools. I suppose that'd be a good translation. But the word is not wise. The word for wisdom is Sophia. It's a, it's a, it's a grand word in the Greek language, but it's foreign to this text here. I think the verse says in our modern English, for you're willing to endure fools gladly because you're so smart. That's the way I translate it today. Look how smart you are. You endure it if a man makes a slave out of you, verse 20. Listen, dearly beloved. First of all, he makes slaves out of you. My Bible says if a man brings you into, and, and he does, this is a first class condition, bring you, the bring you into is, is, is simply a literal, he makes a slave out of you. The minute that you are involved, folks, in any works-oriented system, you become a slave. You've you got to do this or that or don't do that or the other thing or you're not redeemed 
or whatever it is, in any way in which you are put under law, you become a slave. And you now become works oriented. If a man eats you up, actually the Greek says, if he eats you down, I'm going to translate it, uh, if a man eats you up, you know, I'm sure the, the, the verse isn't, isn't saying that they barbecue you and serve you for dinner, but the minute that you become a slave, the minute that you become immersed in the work-oriented ethic, you are devoured in spiritual growth. You have no spiritual growth, no maturity, no opportunity for peaceful fellowship with the Lord. And that's also a first-class condition. If a man take of you, Okay, I assume that the translators were saying that they're taking uh, money from you. I don't think that's what it says. If a man takes you captive, not only m makes you a slave, but makes you, his, makes you a slave, not, not, not God's slave. If a, if a man exalts himself, well, we have this very humble, works-oriented minister. Uh, that isn't what the verse says. My authorized version says, if a man exalt himself, but my Greek says, if a man exalt himself over you, if a man stands over you, or if a man even hits you in the face, no, surely nobody's going around just punching us out. I understand that. Maybe not all of us. You've all heard the expression, well, you know, it hit me like a brick. You know, the, the idea is not a physical blow in the face. I don't think the idea is that there is something devastating in the face so that you don't see the face of Jesus Christ, that you're not beholding the face of God through Jesus Christ, through his word, that you've been struck squarely in the face so that your vision has been blinded, impaired. You know, verse 20 tells me, uh, in, in first class condition, that these are things that are real. These are conditions of reality. These are the marks of one of Satan's ministers. Do not be so quick to leave the verse, folks, because the verse is not centered in physical abuse, but in, in robbing you of the peace and the joy that is yours, that's, that is your right in redemption, by grace. If you are redeemed because you elected to be redeemed and you decided to believe and of your own volition receive Jesus Christ, you are a works-oriented person and your situation is now very touchy because the time's going to come when you don't obey, you don't submit, you do knowingly sin, and you, and you become devastated to learn that your end is not according to your works, but according to Christ. That His work is finished. That it is complete. So that the Scriptures declare that you are complete in Christ. What a marvelous declaration of good news. Dearly beloved, in any way in which I take that from you, I have to that degree made you a slave. A slave to self, a slave to, to law, a slave to works, to obtain merit, to plead and thrash with God as Jacob wrestled with the angel. As though, as though that's some illustration of, you know, of how you obtain redemption. You know, it, it may have great truth for you in your fellowship, your communion, and your walk, but not in your redemption. These things happen in the 20th verse. Verse 21. Speak as con concerning reproach. The word is not reproach. It's dishonor. The 21st verse is saying that I, who am supposed to be a minister and apostle of Jesus Christ, I am dishonored because I didn't do that. I must have been weak. I did not take you captive. I did not eat you up. 
I did not make you my slave. I did not exalt myself over you. I did not become one who smashes your face so that you can't see. So that the very things that you thought were true, they're not true. You don't give enough, you don't work enough, you don't pray enough, you don't study enough, you don't, you don't, you don't lead enough souls to Christ. And all of those things that I could preach on that would make you guilty, poor God doesn't have an, enough power to convict you of that, so I'll do it. And, and I, I can spend a whole you know, sermon on that. Man, I, I, I can't miss. I mean, because I know what you're like. You know, you're rotten, filthy sinners. You know, you're almost as bad as I am. You know, so I pretty much know what kind of people that you are. And boy, I could preach on that. I didn't do those things. I've gotten to be in a position of dishonor because I was weak. However, they show great boldness. So I'm going to show boldness. Are the Hebrews... I am too. Are the Israelites? I am too. Are they of the seed of Abraham? Boy, am I the, of the seed of Abraham. You know, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I got all the, the same kind of backing that they have. I have the same kind of credentials. Now look, are they ministers? Are they the ministers of Christ? I'm going to speak foolishly. I am more. Now, if you had never read this, folks, if you'd never read this chapter, if you had never read this chapter, and if I had read up until this point what you know about modern evangelism, what you see on TV, what you read in books, be honest with yourself. If you had never read this chapter, what would you expect him to say? Are they the ministers of Christ? I more. Are they the ministers of Christ? I more. And all of a sudden, it seems as though the contrast is like an explosion. That isn't what I would expect a, a minister of Christ to boast about. The membership uh, or subscribers is growing. Souls are being saved. We have a greater outreach. You know, we got you know giant crosses up everywhere and pretty little white churches with steeples and and white maybe even a white picket fence. You know, whatever whatever newly paved you know uh, parking lot. You know, that's that's what I would expect. I don't get that reading this. Okay, we are suddenly forced to look at the devastating physical strain that this man endured, the Apostle Paul. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often of the Jews, five times received I, 40 stripes, uh, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings, often in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold, and nakedness. And that is not what I thought I'd hear. I thought I was going to hear, you know, about how many buses Paul acquired to transport people to church and about how big, you know, an attendance uh, uh, those churches had. Those are all, the, you know, the kind of things I would have expected to hear. I didn't hear any of that. In fact, I kept on reading, and it just gets worse if this is the way that an apostle of Christ, a minister of Christ looks like, I'm not so certain I want to be an apostle of Christ. But I believe with all of my heart that that's the way that he looks. They're going to boast. I'm going to boast. Once I was stoned. You know, nobody survives stoning. 
I mean, uh, you know, in fact, the purpose of stoning is to throw stones until the guy's dead and then, you know, pile them over the top of the corpse, I guess. Or, you know, I suffered shipwreck three times. I've been a night and a day in the deep. That means he's thrashing around in the water, you know, you know was, uh, waiting, you know, for somebody to rescue him, you know. And I'm here tearing up Stu's, Stu's stuff on the table here. Hunger, thirst, fastings, cold, nakedness, besides all of those those things that are on the outside, then that which come upon, comes upon me daily is the care of the churches. Do you really think that if the offering stopped coming in, Paul's work and ministry would have stopped? There has to be a violent contrast from any normal concept of boasting. In fact, the last two verses of the chapter shocks most Bible teachers. You know, they seem, you know, so far out of place. Verse 32. You know, in Damascus, the governor under Aretas, you know, the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. You got to be kidding. No. No, no. There was this big bolt of lightning. The, the, uh, uh, the whole garrison was blinded, and I walked right out of, through them, and, you know, they didn't even see me. You know, praise God. That's, 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 what, I, that's what it ought to be, right? Right? Instead, here is this little old guy, hunched down in a basket. They're lowering him down a wall. What a devastating humility. Seems to me that the whole chapter isn't bringing any glory to Paul at all. In fact, I, I need the 12th. Without the 12th chapter, the book would be totally incomplete. I need the 12th chapter to see that it's the grace and the power and the glory of God working through Paul that I don't want to... I don't want to see Paul here. I want to see Christ. It's not like the commentators, all they focus on is, is Paul. I think there's nothing of which to boast. He, he's, he's calling this boasting, you know, God, the guy's got to be crazy, right? Those are not things to boast about. You know, here's a little coward, if you will, you know, being let down in a basket. There's nothing mighty and glorious about that. I want, I, want you, I want you to hear the power of the Lord, the miracles that God performed. Not there. I have to come to the conclusion that the apostle of Jesus Christ is nothing and that Christ is everything. Christ is all in all. Well, it's high watch time pretty much for the next 48 hours. Keep looking up, folks. We are going home soon. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Most importantly, rest in Him. He loves you. He has your best in mind always. He provides your every need. He loves you, and so do we. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.